Good evening. Good evening. Is this yours, Pastor Bob's? Oh, my video, sorry. It's all good. I just don't want it to be something important that you're uh, missing. Well, it says Pastor Chris, 1127. Uh, was it, was it, was it a note to me? <laughs> If you will turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. As we move to a new section of the Bible, um, kind of off subject, but Dad, did you teach through Ezra and Nehemiah when we were over at the trailer? I think so. I, think. I believe you did. It looks like we only have about seven more books of the Bible and we will have preached every verse in the Bible. Uh, so pretty exciting. Uh, we've just came out of the Gospels and we are now moving to the major prophets. Uh, Dad has taught through Jeremiah before, uh, so I'll be skipping that one, but we'll cover all the uh, major prophets. And then we'll go back, the only two books in the, well, three books in the New Testament are the pastoral epistles uh, after we do this. But we're going back to the prophetical books of the Old Testament. And we will likely be in this book of Isaiah for all of 2023. It'll probably take us about a year to get through Isaiah. Isaiah is sometimes called a mini Bible. The book of Isaiah has 66 books, or 66 chapters, just like the Bible has 66 books. There's history, prophecy, poetry, just like the rest of our Bible. And I think it's important that we define what biblical prophecy is. And although there is a predictive element to biblical prophecy, prophecy has always been forth-telling, not fortune-telling. Prophets spoke not only of times far off, but times that were in their immediate time when they spoke to the people. Events that would immediately happen to the nation. And they had to speak in this manner because they had to have prophecies that came to fulfillment to fulfill the office that they were given. Now the prophetic books are filled with events that were locally fulfilled during their time. And I think a sharp distinction needs to be drawn between the portions that have been fulfilled and those things that are yet to be fulfilled. The theme of our book of Isaiah is as the New Testament presents the Lord G Jesus Christ as its theme, so Isaiah presents the Lord Jesus Christ as its theme. Isaiah has been called the fifth evangelist. The book of Isaiah has been called the fifth gospel. Christ's virgin birth, his character, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his second coming, coming are all present in Isaiah with, definite, uh, with the definiteness and clarity. There is also a lot of Isaiah in the New Testament. There are like 66 direct quotes of Isaiah in our New Testament. So let's jump into the book of Isaiah. Isaiah verse one. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah. There's really very little known other than what is given here about Isaiah, who his father was, who were the kings during his time. We don't really have a whole lot of background on who Isaiah was. Verse two, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner and the donkey his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful na nation, a people laden with iniquity, 
offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, for they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. So Isaiah did prophesy during the divided kingdom. Israel was in the north and Judah was in the south. The northern kingdoms had already sinned greatly against God and the southern kingdoms were headed in that same direction. From a human point of view, the nation was, uh, was pro prosperous. They were prospering. They had a good economy. And they still had a form of their religion. They were fulfilling their religious duties. And from their perspective, everything was fine. I mean, we're being blessed. We're doing these things that we said we were going to do. But God sees things as they are, and he could look directly at the heart of the people. Verse five, why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruised and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate, your cities burned with fire in your very presence. Foreigners devour your land, it is desolate, it is overthrown by foreigners. The daughter, daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a city besieged. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teachings of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now God is comparing Israel's sin to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. In 2 Peter 2, 6, it says this. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Skipping to verse 10. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Verse 12, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. The great sin that they were entering into that was like that of Sodom and Gomorrah was their despising of authority and their blasphemy. Verse 11, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling in my courts? Bring no more vain offerings, incenses and abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath in the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourself clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they have been red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, 
you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. The Old Testament saints were never saved by their sacrifices. They were never made clean by their rituals and laws and the standards of clean and unclean for the temple. Salvation has always been in relationship made through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.1 For since the law has but a shadow of good things to come instead of true form, of these realities. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would have not, they, they not have ceased to be offered, since worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is the reminder of your sin every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offering, offerings you have, you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. And this is why I hold to what we might call a three dispensational model of scripture where we look not by how God deals with man according to the law, but how he deals with man according to Jesus Christ. There were those of the Old Testament that looked forward to the coming Messiah. And as we study the book of Isaiah, this is the book that brings out the Messiah more than any other. And then there are us today that look back to the cross of Christ. We look back upon the work Jesus did for our salvation. And then there will be a third group, a third dispensation of those that live during the millennial reign. And those will live with Jesus as king. Verse 21, how the faithful city has become a whore. She who was full of justice, righteous, justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murders. Your silver has become dross your best wine mixed with water. Your princes, your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe, bribe and runs after a gift. They do not bring justice to the fatherless. The widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and I will smelt away your dross as with lie and remove all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselor at the beginning. Afterwards you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed for they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desire, de desired and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen for you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. And the strong shall become tender, and the work a spark, and both of them shall burn together, with none quench to quench them. As we go through the book of Isaiah, Isaiah truly is the message of the gospel, that there is judgment for sin, in the case of Israel, it was their idolatry and their oppression of the poor. But this judgment is a purifying fire. And there is also hope that God will fulfill all his promises. For Israel, there will be a king from David's line. That king will lead Israel in obedience to all the laws. 
and finally the king will establish a new Jerusalem and that blessing will overflow into all the nations of the world. Isaiah also points out that this king will initially be rejected, beaten, and killed by Israel. And by his death, he has made atonement. And that there will be the servants, those who accept the atonement, and then there will also be the wicked, those who reject the atonement. Now this is the interpretation of chapter one as we've studied in an overview of Isaiah. And there are many applications we can make from this chapter, and especially as it applies to America. There are many that want to take this as a direct message to America. And I do think that there is some case we can do this, but I would take extreme caution in applying Isaiah and God's dealing with Israel to America. Can there be applications made? Yes, I believe so. But we must be very cautious because America is not Israel. America is not God's chosen nation. But we do believe that God is sovereign over all. God does act and respond to the actions of nations. But there are two ways in which God acts in national affairs or deals with sin as a whole. God has special divine interventions as he does with Israel and with the nations that he names related to Israel. But God has also established natural laws, laws of cause and effect that governs all creation. For example, smoking, a bad diet, drinking, all have natural consequences for people who engage in such behavior. Poor health is normally the, act, the effect of these actions. Are they a direct judgment or divine intervention of God? No, but they are a judgment in the way that he has set up his natural laws for things to happen. Galatians 6, 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. If you talk to me very much, you realize that I have a belief that America is probably in its last days. That America's downfall will probably be relatively soon. I don't put dates. I don't know if in my lifetime. I don't know if it may even be another hundred years. But I do believe America is on the downward fall. And America's fall will not be because of a divine judgment upon America. America fall will not be the same as God's divine intervention with Israel. But America's fall will be because of the consequences of the natural laws God has established. In the 60s, there was a scientist named John Calhoun, and he created this mouse utopia. where the population of mice would enjoy everything they needed, essentially without any effort. They had unlimited food, unlimited water, plenty of living space, and a population in which to grow in without predators, and so on. Within four years, however, the population had become completely extinct through self-annihilation. Even though all the resources that the mice needed to, for survival were readily available. 
And there was notable periods in the study. There was a strive period where they established territories and making nests and the first children were born. There was an exploitation period where the rapid population growth formed social hierarchies and the offspring higher in those with social dominance. There was a stagnation period where population growth slowed. The males became feminized the females became aggressive, taking over the roles of males. Violence became common. Social disorder skyrocketed. Male mice began to assume female roles. Mouse homosexuality began to emerge. The mice beginning, began mounting the young, the fertility Fell, fell in the male in the females and then the mothers started rejecting their young then there was a death phase the population collapsed none of the young were surviving no longer any conception non-reproducing females resorted to eating grooming and sleeping no interest in socializing no social skills learned by the remaining survivors. No ability to be aggressive, which means no ability to defend their young or their nests. Avoidance of all stressful activities, including anything resembling competition. Preoccupation with grooming and physical attractiveness. Inability to navigate challenges in the real world. And only the outer appearance of being superior, but lacking cognitive and social skills, totally unable to reproduce, raise young, or compete for anything. Humanity today has a striking resemblance to the self-annihilation tendencies of the mice. I will say this though, man is not mice. And I don't think mankind is going to become extinct through self-annihilation. It would be wrong to say that the natural laws for mankind are the same as mice. I don't think that man follows this same exact example of human be of behavior sync. But I do think there are some parallels in this observation of mice, and also in the cycles we see of Israel in the Old Testament. We have said many times there are blessings of prosperity, but there is also blessings of poverty. Israel, when in prosperous times, often forgot God, and in forgetting God, followed the step down, as Dre Vernon McGee points out. They entered into spiritual apostasy, then into moral awfulness, and finally, political anarchy. America is prosperous, even today, with high inflation, high gas prices, and a down stock market. We're still a very prosperous nation. But it starts in the church. The church has entered into spiritual apostasy. The church has become a place of financial advice and motivational speeches. Moral awfulness is increasing. There is crime on the rise every time you turn on the news. Mass shootings and political anarchy is coming next. In closing, I would like to read a quote from Alexander, uh, it's a Russian name, so I'm sure I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, but Alexander Solinsky. He was a Russian writer, and he lived during the Soviet Revolution. 
And this is a quote from him. Over half a century ago, while I was still a child, I recalled hearing a number of old people offering the following explanation for the great disasters that had been fallen Russian, Russia. Men have forgotten God. That is why this is, all this has happened. Since then I've spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of our revolutions. In the process I have read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and have already contributed eight volumes of my own towards the effort of clearing away the rubble left by that upheaval. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I cannot put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That is why this has all happened. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the study of Isaiah. In Jesus' name, amen.